current information technology allows for, the virtual availability of global repositories of quality education. Such sources of knowledge will have a great impact on teaching worldwide. In this context, this video is meant to show a modular approach to teaching oral and maxillofacial radiology. The objective of this module is to provide a differential diagnosis for pathosis that may present as radiolucent with an ill-defined border. Borders may be described radiographically as either well-defined or ill-defined. A well-defined border is one in which most, but not all, the border is distinct. The border may appear either punched out, sclerotic, or hyperostatic. In most instances, a well-defined border indicates relatively slow growth. An ill-defined border presents the picture of a gradual transition from lesion to normal appearing bone, making it difficult to determine the extent of the lesion. In most cases, an ill-defined border indicates relatively rapid growth. A radiolucent lesion with ill-defined borders represents the image of pathosis that generally falls into two categories, inflammatory or malignant disease. When the initial source of inflammation is a necrotic pulp and the lesion is confined to the apical area of a tooth, the condition is called periapical inflammatory disease or apical periodontitis. If the lesion arises in tissue surrounding the crown of a partially erupted tooth, the condition is called pericoronitis. If the inflammatory lesion spreads and is no longer contained to a relatively small area within the jaw, the condition is called osteomyelitis. Acute and chronic osteomyelitis is found at either end of a continuum. Features expressed by each represent for the most part only variations in the degree of bone involvement. There is no difference in the process of bone's response to inflammation. Osteomyelitis may affect patients of all ages. There is a predilection for males and it is more commonly found in the mandibular posterior. Typical signs and symptoms of acute osteomyelitis may include rapid onset, pain, swelling, fever, lymphadenopathy, and leukocytosis. Purulent drainage may also be present. Symptoms of chronic osteomyelitis are generally less severe. A hallmark of osteomyelitis is the presence of bony sequestra within the body of the lesion. In addition, both acute and chronic osteomyelitis may stimulate the formation of periosteal bone. This may occur intermittently, imparting an onion skin-like appearance to cortical bone. Most commonly occurring in young patients, this condition is referred to as proliferative periosteitis formerly known as Garay's osteomyelitis. Acute osteomyelitis presents most often as radiolucent with an ill-defined border. The internal structure of chronic osteomyelitis may vary from radiolucent to radiopaque and the border may be somewhat better defined. The term diffuse sclerosing osteomyelitis is used to refer to chronic osteomyelitis in which bone formation predominates over bone destruction. Osteoradionecrosis is a specific inflammatory condition of bone that may occur following exposure to therapeutic doses of radiation. It is characterized by hypoxic tissue that has a diminished capacity for normal repair. This tissue and its overlying mucosa may break down, leading to superficial infection of the denuded bone. The disease may be asymptomatic early. When ulceration of the surface mucosa occurs, tenderness and pain are common symptoms. Radiographs show an ill-defined mixed radiolucent radiopaque lesion to an almost completely radiolucent lesion involving a significant area of the jaw. In these images of the previous patient, note the destruction of both medullary and cortical bone. A diagnosis of osteoradionecrosis is not difficult when the patient reports a history of radiation therapy directed to the head and neck region. 
The differential diagnosis of osteomyelitis may include fibrous dysplasia, Langerhans cell histiocytosis, Paget's disease of bone, and malignant neoplasia. Osteomyelitis may be distinguished from fibrous dysplasia by observation of the manner in which new bone is laid down. In fibrous dysplasia, new bone is produced within the cortical plates, causing an expansion of the plates, while in osteomyelitis, bone is produced by the periosteum outside the cortical plate. This distinction may be difficult to make when chronic osteomyelitis has destroyed the original cortex. The pattern and extent of bone destruction is also useful in distinguish osteomyelitis from Langerhans cell histiocytosis. In addition, the borders of Langerhans lesions tend to be more punched out and defined than those of osteomyelitis. Periosteal new bone and sequestra are not seen in Paget's disease, a generalized condition usually found to involve the entire jaw. Osteomyelitis may be distinguished from malignant neoplasia by patient history and observation of the pattern of bone destruction. If periosteal bone has been destroyed, malignancy can't be ruled out. The prevalence of oral malignancy is low. It most commonly occurs in males over the age of 50, anywhere in the maxillofacial region. Malignant disease produces destruction of both medullary and cortical bone without periosteal reaction. Its appearance ranges from radiolucent to mixed radiolucent radiopaque with residual islands of bone within the mostly radiolucent lesion. If the lesion involves tooth bearing areas, there is commonly no root resorption or tooth movement. Squamous cell carcinoma is the most common oral malignancy. The patient is usually male over the age of 50. Squamous cell carcinoma most commonly originates in soft tissue and only rarely in bone. Clinical features may include regional lymphadenopathy, paresthesia, anesthesia, foul smell, trismus, grossly loosened teeth, hemorrhage, and later airway obstruction. Pain is a variable finding, and those that arise in bone are frequently silent until they have reached a fairly large size. Squamous cell carcinoma presents as an irregularly shaped and ill-defined radiolucency with no evidence of bone production. There is rapid destruction of both medullary and cortical bone without periosteal reaction. Root resorption and tooth movement is unusual. About half of all malignancies that arise in soft tissue invade bone. If untreated or unrecognized until late in development, this condition is often fatal. Metastatic disease in the jaws is relatively rare. It is most often found in the mandibular posterior in patients in their fifth to seventh decade of life. Lesions are frequently bilateral. Patients may present with pain, paresthesia, pathologic fracture, or hemorrhage from the site. Radiographically, metastatic disease presents as radiolucent with ill-defined to moderately well-defined borders with no evidence for cortication. Lesions secondary to the breast and prostate frequently stimulate bone formation within the central radiolucency. The lesion may proceed to destroy both medullary and cortical bone. Tooth movement and root resorption are rare. In most cases of a known primary lesion, the diagnosis of metastasis is relatively easy. Metastatic disease may be confused with multiple myeloma and primary oral cancer that has invaded bone. However, the borders of multiple myeloma lesions are generally more well-defined and invasion of bone by primary oral cancer can usually be differentiated by clinical examination. In the images shown, note the areas of apparent bone formation within the lesion. This lesion was ultimately diagnosed as metastatic from the prostate. This presentation is an example of educational modules produced by Media Medent for healthcare professionals and students. Should you have an interest in or questions concerning the complete, comprehensive series of presentations 
on oral and maxillofacial radiology, please contact me. Thank you.